you've been watching television recently, you'll have seen an ad with a really fast, blurting voiceover saying that you demand more because you're really smart and this is the kind of car you want because you're smart. It's a Havel. This is the Havel H6. There's already one disappointing thing about this car, the name, H6. It's a bit boring. I like the newer names that Havel are doing, like Jollyon and Big Dog. I reckon they should put the name Goodest Boy on this, don't you? Anyway, serious now. This is the Havel H6 Hybrid. It's brand new in the country and it's here to take on the Toyota RAV4. As always, we're gonna go through all the stuff you need to know about this car, warranty and servicing. We're gonna talk about how it drives, the engine, what you get for your money, the whole nine yards. Now, all along the bottom here, you can see little little bits chopped up so you can jump to the bit you want to know about. Time codes in the description and of course before we get going if you haven't already please hit subscribe and if you enjoy the video hit like and uh, get into the comments if you've got anything to say. Let's get going. The H6 is a medium-sized SUV like a RAV4, CX-5 or an MG HS. This is the second generation and boy does it have a face on it. Quite by chance I parked this next to a Peugeot and there are some real similarities in the way the grille blends into the bumper and quarter panel and has that real feeling of technology. You get these really cool LED headlights, fog lights here at the front with this very stylish if a bit toothy grille, and around the side you see the 19 inch wheels, a few little bits of metallic detailing and a pretty standard profile. Around the back, the old crying clown tail lights that remind me of the old Pajero Sport rear end are replaced with this full width light bar which looks a little bit Porsche. Not a dramatic car once you pass the grill, but handsome enough I think. The Havel H6 Ultra Hybrid starts at 44,990 drive away, which is throwing a pretty decent punch if you're looking at the RAV4. As the name suggests, this is a very well equipped car with 19 inch alloys, LED headlights, keyless entry and start, a hefty safety package, leather interior, two big digital screens, powered everything including tailgate, and this weird double high level brake light. Here in the back, it's really, really roomy. I mean, I've got, well, I've got acres of leg room really. I mean, that seat's a long way forward, but this seat is where I drive. I'm just under six feet tall. I have got a good 15 centimeters of knee room. My feet fit quite happily underneath the seat in front so I can get very comfortable. Maybe I'd like a little bit more under thigh support. I'm really picking here. Uh, the doors only have pockets. There's no bottle holders, but there are cup holders here in the middle. And for once, this is my coffee cup, not Jez's. And that fits in there quite nicely, very comfortable. You've also got air vents. You know how big I am on those things. And there's two USB-A ports. So again, you've got to get your cables right. And headroom, heaps of headroom. Even with this huge sunroof, I can do the patented Anderson coffee cup test. And yes, plenty of room. So like this is a proper back seat and there's more. Now most back seats, you can't sit in the middle, but this one, no problem at all. It's a little bit harder than the outboard seats, but the main thing is the transmission tunnel it's almost non-existent. The floor isn't completely flat, but it's only that high rather than that high. So yeah, you can get three adults across the back of this, I reckon. That's a rarity. Here in the front, very comfortable again. These front seats, the base don't look like much, but they're, they're well padded and it's quite supportive. And the backs are very, they hold you in. They're quite nice. And this is, I'm pretty sure it's fake leather, but it's fine. Um, and these seats are heated as well, which is very comfortable. This screen, it's huge. It is a really big screen and it's beautiful. It's actually, the colors are crisp, it's high res, it looks really nice. The base software, it's much more coherent than it was in the Jollyon. That, that was one of the things I was expecting in this car to, to kind of copy stuff from the Jollyon, but no, it's, it's really good. Everything is crammed into here though. There are very few buttons, so that means that everything's in there. So sometimes it's a little hard to get to some of the functions, but once you've learnt where they all are, it's very, well, it's reasonably intuitive. Let's put it that way. Certainly not bad at all. I'm, I'm quite impressed actually, because there are some manufacturers, like the largest one on earth, that can't put a decent screen in their car. So that's quite good. There's also a digital dash. Not so convinced about this. Some of the stuff is, it's just too small to see. That might be because I need my glasses, but I shouldn't need my glasses if I don't need my glasses to drive to read some of the stuff on here but it, I mean, it looks great and it gives you a lot of information. Plus in this car, you've got a head-up display, which is very clear, which means the stuff I can't read on here 
is mostly up on there. Also, I'm not convinced about this steering wheel. I, I'm just, I'm not sure about it. I don't know what I don't like about it. It might just be the look. Um, the thin rim is quite nice. I quite like the thin rim. Uh, and all the switch gear, all really good. It actually feels reasonably high quality too. Uh, and the materials, none of it's nasty except for some very small moments like down here on the door card. Bottle holder, bit of a pocket. The bottle holder doesn't fit big bottles, so be careful about that. But you have this amazing, this is becoming a thing on cars. You've got this great big um, uh, spot here. You can put phones and other bits and pieces. You've also got a wireless charger there, but you do need USB for the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is kind of pointless when you've got a wireless charger. And there's one USB-A port over here, which when you're the driver is a bit of a pain. Uh, it's just something they haven't flipped from uh, left-hand drive, so that's just a little thing. Uh, cup holders, of course. Here's my cup again, making another entrance, and a quite big center console bin. So again, I'm quite impressed with this because it just it all works really well, you know, apart from a couple of grumbles about the dashboard, and comfortable, well designed, feels expensive. Behind this electric tailgate, again, this is the ultra spec, it's the top of the range. I do love that wide bar, it's awesome. You've got, well, Havel says there's 600 litres back here. I reckon that's a little optimistic, but it is a big boot. It's a good shape too, it's just everything straight in, and the floor is flat here. Loading lip is probably a little high, but that's what you get for getting an SUV. When you put the seats down, it goes up to 1485 litres, which that does feel about right. Now you don't get a spare tyre in this, you get a tyre repair kit, which is all bundled into this weird foam floor. The battery is also back here, not the hybrid battery, that is back here, but it's underneath. But the 12 volt, that's right here. So if you ever need to jumpstart it, which sounds odd in a hybrid, but here we go. If you ever need to jumpstart it, that's where the battery is. So yeah, very practical, plenty of space inside, and that includes the boot. There is an absolute truckload of safety gear on board. You get seven airbags, which includes a front center airbag to stop head clashes in a side impact. That's very important for ANCAP safety rating, which we'll talk about in a second. There's all the usual stability and traction controls, forward AEB, forward collision warning, rear AEB, rear cross traffic alert, lane departure warning, lane keep assist, lane tracing assist. The list is almost endless and it's a very long list. So if I've missed anything, it's in the written review, which is linked down below. And with all of that stuff, the non-hybrid car got a five-star safety rating, and I would very much expect that this would get the same. Okay, this is where things get really complicated. I've spent an enormous amount of time trying to track down information on this system in English. Not much of it was very helpful. Havel sent me a whole bunch of diagrams and pictures and things, but none of it really explained in clear terms how this works. So. I'm, I'm joining dots here, hopefully it's all correct. So, this is the seven in one hybrid system and it's part of what <laughs> GWM, Havel's parent company, Great Wall Motors, it's called the LEMON architecture or um, <clears throat> Lemon. I wouldn't have picked that, but anyway, that's what they've gone with. And it has a thing called the DHT, the direct hybrid transmission. That's the complicated bit I'm not super sure on. Anyway. Under here is a 1.5 litre four cylinder engine with 110 kilowatts and 230 newton metres of torque. That is pretty good. Next to it is an electric engine with another 130 kilowatts and another 300 newton metres. Now, when you put that all together and due to maths and physics and things that I don't understand and are well beyond my ken, you get 179 kilowatts together but they've just added the torque together and got 530 newton meters. That's a lot. That's 911 Carrera S torque, right? That is a lot of torque. So this car isn't slow. Now I've got my iPad here to make sure that I get all of this out. The hybrid system has a 1.8 kilowatt hour battery in the boot and it helps in many different ways. So as far as I can work out, there's also a seven speed gearbox under here there's a two-speed gearbox under the electric engine. They can work separately, so one can switch off while the other one comes on. So at kind of 80 and above, the engine will always directly drive the wheels. 
under that, it'll shuffle around between the, the electric and, and the engine. And under 40, you will get full electric power. Not a lot because it's a 1.8 kilowatt hour. But it's very smooth and Havel have said that one of the things they've gone for is making sure it feels much more like a battery electric vehicle. So we'll talk about that when we take it for a drive. So I think that's all correct. One of the great things about this is if you've driven a Havel with that seven speed gearbox, it's not great. But because of the electric stuff, all of that clunkiness goes away. So that's really good. And that makes a lot of sense just on its own. Forget the fuel savings. That's what's really good about this system. Last thing, you do save fuel. Havel says you'll get 5.2. It took a few miles for the computer to work it out, but I'm down to about 6.9 litres per 100 k's, which for a big unit like this is not terrible, and it keeps going down. Right, I think that's everything. Havel offers a seven year unlimited kilometre warranty, which is really good, and five years roadside assist. There is also a cap price servicing regime, which we don't have the prices for yet, so hopefully they will be in the written review. The standard car, it's pretty cheap, so hopefully that flows through to the hybrid. The battery, though, has an eight-year, 15 million kilometre warranty, so I'm challenging you, yes you, to break that warranty. Eight years, 15 million, that's confidence. So as you can probably tell, this car's a bit complicated, and it might, it might be that way because there's not much information about it in English. We, we've been given, I guess, all we can be given about it, but yeah, there's a lot of diagrams and stuff and, and just information that makes no sense. However, so be that as it may, putting all of that aside, if you just treat the engine as a black box, which let's face it, most people do, and that probably includes about 90% of the people watching this. Hello. Um, it's fine. If you just treat it as a black box, it's not gonna, there's nothing to worry about. Well, one hopes so, anyway. So, the overall feeling though, is that, well, it actually feels more like a plug-in hybrid because of the way the engine and the gearbox and, the, and everything interacts. So, you, you can hear the engine, you can hear it working, but you, it does seem to get more out of the electric motivation than, than a lot of other hybrids do. So, you know, we've driven quite a few hybrids, but yeah, it's, it's a really, it's quite a good system. It's very unobtrusive. There are occasional moments where there's an awkward transition between uh, the, the regen braking, which isn't very strong, and I would actually prefer it if it was stronger. It's a little bit of awkwardness between when it switches between the, the way it's braking. And for most people, again, who cares, whatever. I, I, it's quite an accomplished system. It, it does, it, it seems unnecessarily complex, but according to what information I could find, the idea was to make it feel more like a battery electric vehicle. And around town, it is very electric smooth. I'll give you that. And you know, one of the great upsides of that is it means it's a very quiet car, very quiet. Uh, really, the noise I'm hearing coming from outside is when the engine's running, it's a fairly distant whir, and because it's wet, tire noise. But when it's dry, the tire noise is a little quieter, which translates to tires they probably aren't very good. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so yeah, the, the you press start, you go. It's great. There's some weird things in this car though, really odd. Like, I thought you had to kind of dive into the menus to change it to sport, but I've worked out that on the main screen you just swipe it and then go into sport. And then for some reason, it flashes the hazard lights as though it's warning other drivers, careful. Peter's put it into sport. It just goes chicka, 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 like that. And it's like, and if you were another driver and I'm just sitting in traffic and I just go boom into sport, it's, it's, it's telling people something's wrong because I'm hitting the hazards or I've just decided to park. I don't understand that at all. Uh, that's obviously nothing important. It's just weird. I don't understand that. So you've got 
a few modes, um, Echo, Normal, Snow and Sport. Uh, this is not an all-wheel drive car, uh, so it's not an all-wheel drive hybrid uh, the way the all-wheel drive uh, RAV4 is. There is an, uh, an all-wheel drive version overseas, but for some reason we're not getting it, uh, at least yet. It's the same reason, I think it's a bit weird. We're only getting it in ultra spec. The ride is probably the least convincing part of this car, the ride and handling, I guess. So the balance is a bit weird. It's, it does roll quite a bit in corners, uh, even at moderate speeds, and you can feel it kind of sitting onto the front right-hand tire a bit in a left-hand corner like I just went through there. There's a little bit of pitching and carrying on when you're braking hard. Uh, so that just tells me that the, the chassis is set up quite softly. It is very, very accomplished in the uh, you know, noise, vibration and handling. It's really impressive and this, this hybrid engine really is very, very smooth and very, very clever. So I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and I actually enjoy driving it, not for the dynamics obviously because with very little provocation, I just don't think the tyres are up to it, basically. With very little provocation, that torque just chirps the front wheels. Uh, but even then, <laughs> the traction control system is quite well set up. So it doesn't just go, you know, cut the power. It lets the tyres scrabble for a bit while it works out what you're doing and whether you really want all that power and just kind of backs it off so that the, the scrabbling goes away. Given the biblical amount of rain we've had over the last, I don't know, it feels like seven years now in Sydney. Uh, this has been in pretty much mostly driven in the in the wet and it's, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of and then in the rare moments it's dry, a lot of driving off. So that's a little, I just wonder if that's the tyres. But yeah, when, and I'm, I'm, as I said before, I'm a little bit sceptical about the torque figure of 530 newton meters but having studied the diagrams the mostly incomprehensible diagrams i there's this parallel delivery of the power and torque from the two different power sources from the battery and the and the engine and and yeah maybe it does actually have 530 newton meters of torque going through the front wheels on reasonably cheap hand cooked tires so that's what's happening uh this isn't a car you hustle it's not a car you um you're not driving, you're not going to buy this car for sporting intent. You're going to buy it for the clever drivetrain. You're going to save money on fuel and you're going to get an enormous amount of car for your money. Not every Toyota buyer is going to sit in this car and go, yep, I'm, a, I'm on board with this. There, there are so many rusted on Toyota buyers, there's nothing you can do, there's nothing that Havel can do about them. But I think, you know, this is being filmed in March 2022 when petrol is phenomenally expensive um, you know I normally wave people off say look petrol's not that expensive in Australia calm down but at the moment it is obviously very expensive uh, so people are looking for these alternatives to just a straight uh, internal combustion engine and I think this is a good alternative if you're looking for a mid-sized SUV with plenty of gear and a drivetrain that will save you money on fuel. Uh, look, petrol's not going to be two bucks fifty a litre for forever. I hope. Um, but either way, you're in good shape if you switch to uh, to a hybrid, and I think you're in good shape if you switch to a Havel H6 hybrid. After driving the Jollyon last year, I was expecting the H6 to be. All right, I guess. The Jollyon is quirky and odd in that it's unfinished and things don't work as well as they should, but this feels finished. Everything works really well, apart from a couple of the safety systems being a little bit frantic. The standard H6, it's got that two litre with that grumpy gearbox. All of this goes away in the hybrid. It's a very smooth, really quiet, really comfortable car and it does what it says on the tin. It takes you and your family to things and gets you back and it won't cost you very much to buy and it won't cost you very much to run. And what's critical about this car in these crazy times is that you can actually get one now. You're not going to have to wait 12 months like you do for the Toyota RAV4. So I've come away an unexpected fan of the Haval H6 Hybrid or as I like to call it, the Haval Goodest Boy.